Vanguard Productions. Welcome back, guys, to another installment of the JPS podcast. I'm very excited to have Marta McDonald, founder of Mac Nutrition, on this episode. It's been a long time coming. He's a hard man to catch. So I'm really excited about this one. I can't wait for you guys to listen uh, and learn all about how Martin got into this whole nutrition thing, what Mac Nutrition is all about, and how he uh, has come up with this uh, course that teaches uh, coaches and practitioners an evidence-based practice for diet prescription. So we go balls deep into that, guys, and we also talk about breakfast, whether or not it's the most important meal of the day. We discuss gluten uh, and testing for intolerance, uh, as well as some of the zonulin fears and a few uh, tidbits related to self-sabotage and why that might be the limiting factor for many people uh, in their ability to adhere and achieve their goals when it comes to their diet. So guys, enjoy this show. I'm really stoked to have had Martin on. He's a cool dude and I'm sure you'll all learn a lot from this one. All right, guys, welcome back to the JPS podcast and we have Martin McDonald, MacDonald, not McDonald, uh, (laughs) from uh, MNU which is Mac Nutrition University. He's a clinical performance nutritionist. He's the CEO and founder um, of Mac Nutrition, which was his consultancy practice back in 2008. Um, and only recently in 2016, he founded Mac Nutrition University, which is what many of you will be familiar with and have seen uh, doing the rounds on social media because he is everywhere. He's doing really good things, very engaging and informative. Um, pe- some people think he's funny. I don't think he's funny at all, which is why I got him on the podcast, right? Uh, <laughs> but we're here and we are going to talk about all things strength training. No, I'm kidding. We're talking about nutrition because that's what he does. Uh, he also lives. Talk about strength training. He also lives as well. <laughs> he also lives as well. But um, Martin, I guess for those uh, down under who will be listening and may not uh, have reached out or seen your work online, tell us a little bit more about your training and dieting background. You know, you were a bodybuilder back in the day. You just posted on Instagram not too long ago some uh, yeah. pretty epic ab. Ab veins and uh, yeah. cuts in the midsection, which was awesome. That was 10 years ago, was it? Yeah, yeah, that was. Um, that was from – so, yeah, basically I got into bodybuilding before I got into kind of nutrition, I suppose. It was just through <clears> – I <throat> actually, I don't know when the last time I was on a podcast and I do, you know, these kind of who are you. But um, I, I mentioned I, I played football, so soccer, and um, – I ruptured my cruciate ligament and um, it kind of put me out of football and I ended up taking up the gym and I'd always liked muscles. I I bought an Arnold's encyclopedia to bodybuilding when I was quite young. Yeah, good. I think it's almost a rite of passage a bit. It is. um, So yeah, I like muscles and, you know, I had abs and I went and actually watched a bodybuilding show, a natural bodybuilding show close to my, uh, my home. And the guys in the under 18s category were like, I was like, yeah, I, I'm as good as them. And it was quite a weak lineup of 18 year olds. Anyway, like three weeks later, I signed up for a bodybuilding show and I did a two week Atkins diet because I was like, I don't know where I got that from at that age. And um, I rocked up and it was like an eight man lineup in the junior section. And they were all like jacked 18 year olds. And I came last place and it was horrific. And, um, you know, I literally thought I was just going to rock up, not really having done any half decent training, um, not particularly genetically blessed or anything. And yeah, I came last place and thought, well, that's a load of crap, not doing that again. And actually, 
I was on a um, a documentary on the Sky Discovery Channel. I went to university and I went through these auditions and they saw me or, or those auditions and they were like, oh, you were a massive failure. And the point of this show was like to show a journey and they gave me like this celebrity personal trainer and this celebrity nutritionist who were actually freaking morons. Like at the time I didn't know, but now I'm like, they were complete bros, like so much pseudoscience, so much crap. Um, but they were supposed to prep me for this show. Anyway, I got back into bodybuilding and um, then carried on doing it for until I was 23. And um, yeah, I've spoken on a few podcasts about how how badly I did everything and, and you know, just following trends and the biggest guy in the gym who, you know, not, wasn't necessarily natural and um, following just online magazines, everything. Anyway, so that was kind of like my natural bodybuilding thing. But then I was studying my degree and then I did my master's and then my postgraduate. So that was like MSc in nutrition and postgrad in clinical nutrition. Yeah. And then started, I was, I was un, 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 lecturing undergraduates when I finished my degree, did my, my master's part time and was just lecturing kind of graduates, um, undergrads and then Yes. Yeah, and yeah, so I was doing that part time and then got my MSc, founded Matt Nutrition in 2008. And then just kind of I never got a job. And I kind of tell people this. It's like there's no jobs in nutrition, like unless you're going to work in a hospital as a dietitian. And in the UK now, they've cut the funding massively in that area. And um, so I, and now I'm like, this is a big part of what I'm doing is making nutrition and kind of doing an evidence based, legitimate, non going to push loads of crappy supplements or push like crazy, you know, one size fits all diet plans, but still able to make money and um, make a living helping people. So yeah, a big part of what I'm doing now, but for me, it was like a massive struggle initially. And um, yeah, just kind of found my way, built my consultancy up. And obviously I was, I was lucky and I've kind of spoken about how I got lucky in a few ways. I worked really hard and, um, but yeah, built my consultancy up to kind of, you know, having staff and uh, we got like, I worked with a few celebrities and we had kind of corporate wellness programs that we managed to get the contracts for and working with athletes and general public. And then, yeah, as you sort of said there, 2016. And in fact, before that, like 2014, no, no, 2012, 13, because uh, I went, I, I worked with a lot of athletes. Like I've been to two, maybe three Olympic games supporting like some of the best athletes in the world and um i think that gave me a certain legitimacy in the in the personal trainer world and so started doing these mentorship stuff for, for pts and just i love education like i would i'd probably still be a lecturer now if you didn't have to do marking and you didn't have to tell people off and you didn't have all the crap red tape um i just like i love educating i love speaking in front of people uh you know, it's loads of stuff you said there about people thinking I'm funny, like I'm being a bit more jovial. Like I'm, I was quite stiff to begin with on, on social media. I'm a bit like, cause I'm an academic and I didn't want to like, I wanted to be respected. That's a big thing for me. I like being respected. I like people asking my opinion on stuff. And, but that kind of made me lose my real life personality on social media. Cause I was very like, Oh, this study, this, and didn't want to be seen to be a bit of a joker. But now that I'm doing okay and like that like business is booming and all these kind of things I'm just like ah whatever I'm just going to be myself and everyone's like oh you're quite funny actually you're not just this um geek who just reads papers um but yeah it's stand up presenting very much I'm my, myself you know when you're in a room with people I just love that and it's one of the big things I don't know if you know this Jacob but I, I want to come to Australia to do some talks I want to basically do some talks around the world and um you know, so one of the, when you were like, oh, do you want to come on the podcast? I was like, hell yes. Like, uh, get, tell some people about me in Australia so that they'll come and listen to me do a talk. So yeah. Anyway, that's, that's kind of a real long background to me. No, no, that's, that's awesome. I think, um, yeah, a lot of the listeners will, will love hearing about that. And it's certainly some things that I can resonate with personally, you know, is coming from, you know, somebody who wanted to be taken seriously um, by my followers and my clients, you know, when I first started uh, as a PT, I was very much the same. You know, very. You know, this is what the science says. You know, here are the hard facts. You know, this is what it is, and I'm very professional, and I don't smile unless you know 
um, it's at my children or things like that. It's you know very down the line. But um, like you, the more that I've sort of grown in the industry, I've become very much myself, and people are starting to go, "Hey, this guy's just a regular dude." Um, you know, he just happens to do this whole fitness thing on the side, and I think um, that's a, a, something that comes with maturity, but also. Uh, I dare say a little bit of success and confidence as a result of you know seeing the proof in the pudding, um, for sure. But yeah, I think your journey is quite an interesting one, Martin. And what's made it even more interesting because obviously a lot of people get into nutrition, they do their bachelors, or you know they start to become um, a consultant and they go down that route. It's it's a pretty natural progression um, for most people. Um, however. You sort of took a different route and thought, hey, I'm going to start my own uh, university, (laughs) which is, you know, when I think about that, it's pretty mind-boggling because that takes some real balls um, to do and not only balls but a lot of initiative um, and to, you know, be able to think outside of the square, which is something I I really admire um, with you and MNU is the fact that it's very different to most uh, other courses out there and I guess what you do is very special uh, in that it delivers evidence-based content. So what was the driving force behind you know starting uh, Mac Nutrition University? You, you explained that it was a um, <coughs> your passion for education but that takes a lot of work. There's a lot of work before you get the opportunity to educate, right? Um, so you know, how did you you know, what was driving that from the onset? Yeah, um, like loads of things. It's a little bit of like the stars aligning. So <clears throat> we were running these like two-day weekend mentorships, which was basically like cramming, or like trying to cram all of the the essential stuff that people could know. So one of the things was about our weekend mentorship was I saw – you know, what was that, like four years worth of MSc students coming through you know, like a, a university in, in the UK called Loughborough, which is like the best sports university in the UK. And none of these people getting these MSCs ever getting jobs. And I was like, oh, my goodness, like you're putting yourself in debt to get this qualification and you're coming out of it. And they're all just going and doing like either falling out of the industry or going and being an unpaid intern for three years and, you know, just craziness. So I was like, right. I'm going to teach people what I've learned in these four years, you know, a tiny bit about marketing, a tiny bit about SEO. Like I ended up being quite good at search engine optimization because I didn't have any clients. So I just read about that stuff and um, it, teaching them about, you know, like the real practicalities of working with people because on that academic level, no one was doing it. No one was going like, you learn like, Oh, eight grams per kilogram carbohydrate and this, that and the other for athletes. And, these sports drinks and these four supplements that work and but there was no like consultation skills or how to set up a 90 minute consultation to get the best out of the uh, best out of that person how to you know again even just telling them by the way do you know what people lie i don't know if you know this but they'll pay you money and they'll lie to you and that's a real thing and if you don't know that you'll lose sleep and you'll feel like you're an idiot rather than the fact that people are lying to you so all of this stuff crammed into two days and then we did this for a few years and people like we were like, what do you want? And they're like, we want something more long term. We want a qualification. We want and, and actually you put out this thing of like, what would you like to see? And honestly, the the stuff that people wrote, I just completely shut down. I was like, I can't deliver that. That's they literally described MNU. But when they first said it, I was like, not gonna happen. Like I can't deliver such a massive scale scenario. So th- that was like early 2015. And um then towards the end of 2015, I kind of got this bug again for it. And and that's where kind of the second part of it comes in, in terms of, I was like frustrated. Like I've spent a lot of my career calling people out and I, I became a little bit known for it. And I suppose I'm still known for it a little bit. Um, I got myself in my fa- fair share of trouble for doing so. Um, and, uh, but, but I've always been like, I to this day, I've never, I stand by every single thing I've said. And, um, you know, I've never been found guilty of anything, you know, saying anything untrue or or anything slanderous or anything like that. Um, But, you know, it gets you in trouble. But then the the backlash of that is always, well, why don't you do something 
about it. And I'm like, I'm flipping here doing something about it. I'm putting out content. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. Um, but then the big thing was, well, why don't you educate people? Why don't you create something that will help people? And um, there's also that thing that I'm sure you've dealt with. It's like you see these clients coming to you and they're like, they've been failed by so many practitioners before and you kind of inherit these broken people and it sucks. And like one of the reasons I struggle to work with people now is because I in emotionally invest in them too much. And it like with having children, having a business, having staff, having a big, like quite a big business now, I can't actually, I will literally wake up thinking about people and like, it's no good for my, I don't have the, the emotional uh, reserves to give to people. But yeah, you, you meet those people and it's like, it does make you angry then when you see crap online, people saying rubbish and teaching rubbish. And, and then because of my name got bigger, I started to get all of these messages about people doing these other online courses, like I did this online course, it was rubbish. I got taught about, you know, gluten's going to kill you and like, you should be manipulating macros based on body type and like all of this stuff. And like, and then I even got this like agony aunt thing of, I asked them for a refund and they wouldn't give it to me. And it's like flipping heck, like it's not my job to look after you. But at the same time, you like personally, I'm like, well, they're coming to me. I've got a responsibility. I've got, I've got a little bit of a following. Therefore I should be telling people, don't do this course. Don't do that. You're getting ripped off, whatever. Um, but anyway, someone then said to me, look, you, you're part of the problem. Like this was someone I actually really respected. He was like, you're part of the problem. It's Chris, I'll, I'll name him because he won't mind. It's Chris Burgess from Lift the Barn. He was like, you're part of the problem. And I was like, the hell? I was like, how dare you? And he was like, well, you're not offering an alternative. You've, you're, you know, you're really well known in the UK and um, you've got a bit of a following all over. Why don't you just do it? And then so I got back on this trail of, and then I was like, it's just such a big endeavor. I, we, I don't have enough staff. It's you know, I'm always trying to like train my staff and like, it's difficult to to bring someone into your business. Lots of the good people are out there doing it themselves. Like people like you, like you've got a podcast, you're, you're, you're not going to necessarily go and work for someone else. So building up those kind of people who want to be led, but are still high flyers, big hitters or whatever. So anyway, long story short, I actually got this client and I, I was telling someone this behind the scenes and it's I suppose it's okay for me to say it public. I, I might have said this publicly elsewhere, but basically, essentially, a billionaire wanted to work with me and had been referred by someone I know very well, and kind of I like, owed him a favour. And I was like, I don't, I don't work with um, people anymore. And then my, you know, so my friend was like, please, please help him. He's such a good guy, um, and like he'll pay you, you know, whatever your time's worth. And I was like, I would really love to, but. I just don't like, I don't have time. I don't have the, I don't enjoy it anymore. And it was like, look, it's kind of a blank check. And I was like, what does that even mean? And, um, I was like, look, I'm not really motivated by money. Um, you know, I could charge him through the nose and, and whatever. I was like, look, I don't, it's not my bag, whatever. And he's like, look, just come and meet him. He'll pay you for the day. Just come and do it. We'll we'll go out for lunch. It'll be nice. We'll catch up. Fine. Went down and met him. This guy was the loveliest guy I've ever met. I've worked with a lot of rich people. A lot of them haven't been nice. He was a billionaire, probably one of the richest men on the planet. And um, he was just so nice. And I was like, I could actually help him. But I was like, it's, I don't want to. And then I, he basically said to me, I was like, it won't make me happy. Work with one of my staff. They're just as good at me, if not better. But he was like, but I've been, but you're the best. And I'm like, I'm not the best. And he's like, well, why are you the boss then? And I'm like, good question, but, but they're better than me. And anyway, he ended up going, how much is your happiness worth? And it's like, what a question. It's like, just, just help me. And so I basically went back to my staff and was like, desperate to work with me. I don't know what to charge. And then this, the, it was basically how much will it cost to shut Mac nutrition, stop taking on clients, close our business and just write Emma new what is that figure? Um, and basically I wrote that down on a, on an email and sent it to him and he deposited all the money within 60 minutes. And then we shut the consultancy, didn't take on another client from December, 2015. And I told my staff, like, we won't take on any clients for like three, six months, whatever. 
and we still haven't taken on a, a member of a, a client since because MNU just blew up into this ridiculous thing that it's become. You know, I, I'm not sure how aware you are of this, but it was supposed to be 50, 50 students just from the UK. Like our tagline was like the UK's first evidence based 12 month online nutrition certification. And um, we went to get 50 people and then it was like we launched it and it was like 150 people in 25 countries. And we we're like, oh, geez, we probably need to cap it there. And then it was like, oh, we'll do two intakes a year. Bam, another 150 sign up instantly. And then it's like a thousand people express interest. And we're just like, oh, crap. Like, what have we done? This has got so big. And you don't realize all this stuff behind it because we want to we want to do it um, properly. It just it's just kind of taken over. Uh, yeah, everything we did. And it it's become amazing because I've always wanted to educate people in like you're working with clients, you're helping 10 people, 10 clients, 20 clients, whatever. But now it's just been that thing of going, oh, this is so cool. We can educate, you know, whatever, a thousand trainers. And they, if they've all got 20 clients, how many people are benefiting from, from that stuff? So anyway, that's kind of like the, the thing of like why it happened. And it just came out of a need, I suppose, in the industry, just seeing there just wasn't anything out there that was kind of truly, wholly evidence-based that was going to teach people start to finish. What is evidence? Why is it necessary? How do you read research? How do you turn research into real life practice? All of those things. Um, how do you deal with some of the, like, the clinical stuff that we, you know, as personal trainers, like you've got a scope of practice, but we also have to, I say we, I've never been a personal trainer, but I'm just kind of like, can I be an honorary <laughs> one? Um, but yeah, like you get people coming to you with pre-diabetes or PCOS, all these kind of things. And like there, there needs to be some awareness. Otherwise you get people going off the, on the whole crap, organic this and, and oh, pesticides are causing that or gluten's causing this. Because, you know, we've got just an evidence-based filter and there's like, oh, but we, I never got taught about that stuff. So what do I do? Well, I'll go off and, and read the internet, which is a minefield. So, um, yeah, have I answered your question? <laughs> You definitely have. That was very cool. Thank you for sharing that. And I guess, you know, in alignment with what you're uh, finishing on there, one of the first modules in uh, your Mac Nutrition uh, degree is the evidence-based learning uh, process. And that's how we do start to disseminate good information from bad information. Um, and we can have a much better understanding of what is relevant, what is not, when to apply things and the context that they do apply, all those kind of things. So can you outline to listeners, you know, I guess, you know, how this is approached without giving too much away, obviously, because we want people to, you know, pay you for your uh, time. But I guess I think it's always good for even individuals who may not necessarily want to practice to understand, um, you know, the first step to improving their ability to think critically. Yeah. I've got no, I've got no issue giving as much as I can give away in 90 minutes. I'm not, uh, I, t I tell you what, if I could give away too much value in 90 minutes, it wouldn't be a very good course. So yeah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's true. Uh, like some, some of the reports out of it is like, Oh, I've learned more in this one year of my degree, uh, one year of MNU than I did in my three year degree. And, you know, more proud of MNU than I am my masters. And, you know, we've got doctors and dietitians doing it. So it's, um, yeah, I think it's we we come at it from a very different perspective. Of, it's kind of taught. Like MNU's taught by practicing, like MSc qualified nutritionists, registered dietitians, people who have, um, you know, consultants for the Nice guidelines. And at the same time, those are the tutors that are people are interacting with. Like it's not a textbook course. It's not a do this course and then you get some admin people dealing with you. It's like you get to interact with these high level, highly qualified individuals doing great stuff on a daily basis within the student support group and then the mentoring lab. Um, uh, so like the evidence based side of it, I think is, is one area. I've seen a few arguments on Facebook about this recently, where people just completely misconstruing what evidence based practice is. So even even people trying to, I suppose, insult MNU because they're like, oh, yeah, that's kind of the sciencey course. But if you want to do something that's a bit more coaching related, you should do. And it's like, 
I, it just focuses on studies and it's like, geez, that is not what evidence-based practice is. Mm. And, um, I should, I actually basically created a um, definition of evidence-based practice and I, I should, um, I get it up on here, but it, basically talking about how it should, um, I'll just find it for you really quickly. Um, it's quite long actually. Um, okay. So here you go. It's, it is quite long, sorry. But evidence-based practice is the conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of current best empirical evidence when making decisions about how to practice when providing information and care for clients slash patients. The best evidence should be combined with practitioner expertise and should consider the characteristics, state, needs, values, and preferences of all those who will be affected. Um, so yeah, that was basically through through researching the first module of MNU. That's kind of taking different sentences and sections of, of all different evidence-based research. And um, because it's not just like practitioner expertise is stuff like what's going to be right for this person in this situation. Likewise, what are their values and beliefs? And because if they don't believe in it, if it's, it's against their values or anything like, OK, protein's the best for muscle building. And, that, and meets the best source of protein or dairy. And it's like, okay, this person's a vegetarian or vegan. It's like, that's not going to work. Use your practitioner expertise. Likewise, kind of different methods. Again, we teach a massive underpinning of a principle. Like what's a principle of X, Y, or Z? Like fat loss is the easiest one to talk about. You know, there's lots of people out there who think the principle of fat loss is something to do with hormones or carbs or insulin or gluten or organic toxic fat cells, I don't know, whatever. I don't realize that the principle is, is energy balance and we need to create an energy deficit. And then there's a million, there's that, there's that famous quote, which I should probably be able to um, reel off, but it's something to do with, you know, a man who, you know, focus on, on methods will always fail, but a man who understands principles will be able to, you know, pick from a million and one different methods to get results. So if you want to do intermittent fasting, if you want to do low carb, these various different methods, um, you need to understand the principle, you need to understand the mechanism. So our evidence based approach is like, right, let's start from the beginning and teach them. So what is evidence based approach? And then we teach them, okay, we're going to talk to you about some biochemistry here. And what we've done with m is strip out all the bunk. So, you know, it one one 90 minute lecture on MNU probably took us about a hundred hours of combined work to put together because there was writes and rewrites and obviously all the research that we were reading, but basically going, we would, I would sit down with my staff and say, okay, I want you to do this section. This is what I want from it. This is what it should look like. This is what I want them to understand at the end of it. And then they present it to me and I'd go, cool. That's really interesting. I love that. How would that help you help a client? And they'd be like, um, well, maybe it wouldn't be specific to a client, but you'd need to know this. And I, okay, when have you ever considered that biochemical pathway when making a decision for a client? Well, I haven't, but it's just really interesting. Right, get rid of it. And it was just that thing of if we need to put everything someone needs to know in a year, we actually had to remove so much stuff. Like we don't go into flipping the Randall cycle, the Krebs cycle. It's like you don't need to know that stuff. It's like, yes, if you're going to do a PhD, cool you might need to know it. Yes, if you're going to be a high level academic, yes, maybe you need to know it. I learned about that stuff. But likewise, I couldn't reel off the, I couldn't even reel off just like the basics kind of glucose, glucose 6-phosphate, fructose 6-phosphate. That's me. I'm done. NADH, I've just remembered that one. It's like, it's irrelevant. What, when have I ever used that with a client? Never. So we stripped that out. And we just went, what are we going to do? What's evidence-based practice? So then we teach them about research skills. And um, I don't know if you've ever done like a research skills module, at, like uni or whatever, but it freaking sucks. It's so boring. No one likes yeah, it. it. No one remembers it. Um, so we just did research methods. What do you need to know? So we taught the very, very basics. Because what we want to do is empower people. Like I've heard about like, nutrition coaches or whatever doing their certification. And then the next minute they're on social media. I'm eating 5,000 calories, but I'm not eating any carbs. And therefore I can lose fat. And it's like, they've basically just not been taught to a level where they don't end up being a moron. It's just like, I have, I fully believe that no one who ever graduates MNU will ever be that gimp. They'll just, we just don't, we just produce people who don't go 
crazy, just to crazy town. It's just, we, we teach them, okay, this is what research is. This is how to read it. And the basics of like a p-value, like what is the p-value? What is statistical probability? Like the real, real basics. We don't in, go into all of the cool or not cool, big and complicated, boring stuff. It's just how do you read a research paper? What, how do you like understand the body of evidence versus like what's a meta-analysis versus systematic review, etc. And then we just build them up from there. Then we go into some biochemistry. Um, and then we talk about like health. What is health? So I created this MNU mantra of health, which is, again, I, like we try to push a lot of ethics and integrity and scope of practice, like throughout the whole course, as well as every single lecture telling a story of how this helped, like even just talking about amino acids, like tell a funny story. Also to say how you ended up talking to a client about something, how to remember something. Um, but then like, what is health? We're trying to push this thing of when you sit down with a client, don't just instantly think macros. Don't just instantly think energy deficit. Don't, you know, how are you affecting their financial health by what you're about to tell them? How are you affecting their intellectual social health? Like with regards to flexible dieting practices, if you, and it's really hard, like to, to, to think about all those things at once. I don't recommend you, you literally think about them, but it's having that understanding that if I start recommending these supplements, like how is that going to affect this person? Or if I, if I start working with this person as a client, can they still afford the psychological support, which they clearly need for X, Y, Z. And actually maybe I'm a lower cog in their goals. They need to spend that money on this person, like maybe a, a like a, a physical trainer, may, like maybe they're having back issues that would actually be better sorted first, that they may have some kind of restrictive binge eating disorder, et cetera, where nutrition is not their issue. You can, you are way down the pecking order until someone gets their kind of um, psychology on track to be able to achieve a goal. So yeah, that's like evidence-based practice, such a big thing. It's, it's, it, it's not just abstracts and research and PubMed. It's so much more the combined best evidence. Um, yeah, and, and requires you to be a coach. Like, yeah. I, lo I loved all of that. No, no, no. You don't need to stop talking. It's brilliant. I think, like you, I'm very much... Um, I actually wrote an article for Alan Aragon's research review on uh, evidence-based coaching a, a mythical fairy tale um you know basically outlining how there's a, a lot of pub med warriors who you know sit in the ivory tower tower and uh ivory tower sorry and you know just throw stones at those who aren't you know on pub med reading the research and stuff and claiming that they're not evidence-based when in reality, you know, we know that there's these three inextricably related components, you know, which are the patient client values, uh, clinical experience, as well as, you know, the best available research. And to ignore one or the other at any given time would be a fundamental, uh, you know, betrayal to the inherent, you know, purpose of this concept. And I think, you know, when we talk about any concept, it's important to understand, you know, where it originates. And, you know, we know that, you know, evidence-based practice originated in the, you know, medical community as a means of prescribing, uh, you know, medication to people. Um, and I think that's important when we, you know, look at that. We know that doctors aren't always there reading research, but they're getting that feedback from their clients. And, you know, the more clients they see over time, the more able they are to better and more efficiently and effectively prescribe, um, you know, the right medicine, right? And I think that's what as personal trainers, nutritionists, you know, our, that's our goal. We have to prescribe, um, you know, the right means or the right approach for our client. And the goal is to be able to do that quicker and more effectively over time so that we can get the job done, um, you know, that saves their money and obviously makes us seem like we know what we're doing, right? Yeah. And I think everything you said there was absolutely brilliant. So, no, thank you for sharing that. And I think it's cool to see... Um, more practitioners who are not just solely biased towards the literature um, because it's, it starts the process, but it isn't, you know, the be-all and end-all. And something that I, I speak about to my mentorship students, I'm sure you'll agree with, is that, you know, we have what's theoretically optimal here and then we have what's practically possible here, a.k.a. the real world. And yeah. over time, we try to bridge that gap, sure. We try to push 
and strive for improvement towards optimal, but there are times where we have to, you know, adjust our expectations and lower our standards. And I think evidence-based practice is understanding the uh, interplay between these two things. So no, very cool to hear you express all that, Martin. So thank you. And I guess being able to explain the why behind the physiology and the biochemistry of nutrition is critical for coaches because that allows us to bridge the gap between science and then the real world because that's that's what we're doing, yeah? Um, and then we get buy-in. So we need to educate to get buy-in so that people listen to what we have to say. So what is your advice for coaches you know, to improve their communication of this um, without confusing or overcomplicating things? Because I, I know myself, when I first got into evidence-based community, you know, for lack of a better term, sometimes I really don't like using it. Um, but I think it depicts what, you're tr what you explained and how you define it brilliantly. Um, but I was very confused because I'd read about you know, protein synthesis and, you know, the leucine threshold and anabolic pathways, mTOR and all these things. And I was like, I was like, oh yeah, cool. I'll tell my clients and they'll listen and they want to get jacked. So they, you know, they know that I know what I'm talking about, but like you said, they don't need to know that, you know, um, I don't even know, need to know about, you know, mTOR and anabolic signaling and those kind of things. I need to be able to teach people how to lift and write a good program, progress that program over time and all those kind of things. So you know, what, what are the things that you've learned over the years um, that have made the communication and being a science communicator, which is what you are now, um, a little easier? Yeah. So I think <clears throat> in all of these things, there's like, it's funny, there's that tendency when you learn about something new and it's like, oh, this, this, sort of, <sighs> you're so interested in it. So you kind of want to talk about it with your client, but understanding that, um, I suppose a key thing that we teach on M and U is we in the mentoring lab. There's there's lots of lectures that support M and U but aren't within the qualification. And one of those, Sarah, um, who's the head of nutrition at Mount Nutrition, Sarah and I deliver this essentially like a personality profiling lecture of this concept that we've kind of developed a bit from from other areas of research. And it's it's a very common sense thing, but until someone like us goes and puts it into boxes it might be you might miss something or you don't necessarily think about it so while it's common sense it's like oh I could be doing that better so we talk about how there's different types of clients and some of them we call them blues will be like your numbers and stats and really super interested and so some of these t these types of clients is like you can get away with talking a bit about protein synthesis or talking about 0.3 grams per kilogram protein and they'll lap that up and actually you'll get more buy-in from those types of clients like i remember you know sarah be like there you know in these in this in the early days i'm like geez what's taking you so long and it's like oh i'm just sending him some pdfs of some papers and i'm like what she's like no he he will love this and then he comes back and he's like oh my goodness i read those papers so interesting and she just got buy-in and sometimes as well we, you know we we teach this sort of stuff with regards to let's say Sarah is working with a bodybuilder and she's like a, a, a slight female and, and they're, you know, like, Hmm, she's, you know, I've heard she's good, but like, she doesn't necessarily look like she lifts. Um, or, you know, they, they're kind of thinking, Oh, how am I going to get the most out of her? She'll overcomplicate slightly. She will literally talk about leucine threshold just briefly. And then like, cause we do a lot of re reflective practice within the workplace and again, kind of viewing each other's consultations and giving feedback just to, cause it doesn't happen enough in the real world. So we do it, we, we, we make a, a point of doing it and I'll just see their demeanor change completely where like, oh geez, she knows what she's talking about. This, she's like a, some sort of crazy mad scientist who's going to get me super jacked. Um, but then on the flip side, you know, there's like, there's yellows, greens, reds, blues, like reds, again, it kind of typically you need to give them a lot of autonomy and these kind of things. Blues, uh, greens, sorry, a bit kind of quite sociable and the and different elements of greens and yellows. There's also an, an element of you having to change your personality slightly to suit them. So greens can be, I think she's the expert on this, but a bit more needy. And so need need you to pick up the phone. So we teach about, okay, maybe set their service up less on maybe providing 
information and notes and actually just being on the end of the phone a little bit more just to be there to encourage them. So there's this phrase, I'm sure you've heard it, but like think coach, speak client or, you know, anything like that. So it's like you need to think about protein synthesis a lot of the time. You, you need to think about how am I going to maximally stimulate that through in the gym, through, you know, progressive training or through nutrition to augment the adaptations that training is bringing about. But at the same time, you don't need to go 0.3 grams per kilogram. You need to be able to go 80 times 0.3 is 24 and 24 is about this much chicken. And and therefore speaking to them about, OK, you know, you want to have this, you know, this much, you know, you, know, you shake after training and, and speaking like that. And so for me, a lot of this, like we have three pillars of MNU, wisdom, confidence and integrity. And the confidence side of it is if we teach you so well and you understand the areas so well, and we've told you how it applies to real life and how to um, teach that to your clients and what that looks like. We, we have these homeworks where every single homework on MNU is optional, but every single homework is either designed to make you a better practitioner or to start slash develop your business. So there's things within there with regards to like, so like, create this and this will you can give this to clients or create this and you can put it on your social media or create this and it's your onboarding process for xyz and then actually anyone who submits a homework to us they then get our model answer so as a level of accountability so you kind of said at some point i can't remember if it was off the call or what but about like what makes them and you different um, or yeah you kind of said at the beginning of the podcast it's delivering something very different to what other people are and it's it's at that kind of level of the whole course is set up to make someone a, a viable business at the end, but a viable practitioner and knowing what they're doing. So they have resources such as food diary template or um, pre-consultation form. We don't just, oh, here you go, just chuck, chuck them a load of downloadable documents. It's like create your own based on what you've been taught. We'll give you our model answer. You can adapt it based on you and your personality and how you like to format stuff. Um we have these core skills as well at the end of each um, each module has a core skill that we believe if you have these six core skills, you they are the six core skills you need to be, a, you know, a good, effective, successful practitioner. Um, so so all within that area of that communication stuff that's speaking to the client that. OK, what does that amount of protein look like for that type of client is all knowing the area really, really well so that you can explain it. Because if you fumble your words and you're like you're trying to explain something again, this is like staying within your lane. Like, don't try and be overly clever. Just just tell them. And again, if you don't know it, just tell them. But this this great level of confidence that I think people are starting to notice, like, geez, MNU sh students or MNU graduates, are they just so confident. They're just so. Um, what was the other one that I had on Instagram? Oh, the MNU students just seem to be so inspired. And it's like, that was quite a nice bit of feedback for me in terms of um, making them that way. But uh, one thing that came into my head when you were actually first asking this question was the Albert Einstein quote of um, make everything as simple as possible, but no simpler. So it's, you know, you don't need to wow or confuse your clients to I think there's a certain lack of confidence in I, I see this in other educators sometimes. They try and overcomplicate stuff to, oh my goodness, I went to your talk at that expo and I didn't I hardly understood any of it, but you're so clever. And it's like I'd be gutted if people came out of my talk saying that they didn't understand any of it. Because it's like, you know, it's not useful information then, is it? Um and I think that's one of the nice compliments I've had on, on various different podcasts I've been on. When I've talked about slightly higher level stuff, it's like you do make it understandable. And even for me, I geek out. I want to be that that guru, that one, that person like I, I read all the research. I've studied so much. I want to be the one who people are like, oh, he whatever can talk to, talk about these things. But actually, I've realized there's much more value to be had in actually don't try and overcomplicate it. Make it as simple as possible, but no simpler. And once you can do that and you can explain it to your grandmother, and if she gets it, then you can be an effective coach. Yeah. I. Everything you're saying is just like in, in my books, big tick, big tick, big tick. I'm, I'm all about you, Martin. This is great. I'm really, <laughs> I'm really enjoying uh, getting an insight into how you do things. I think... 
yeah, even for me learning more about what you do at MNU, you know, I would dare say, if, without sounding arrogant, that I, I don't know my stuff. You know, I listen to the right people, I read the right research, and I've been doing it for a while, so I, I know how to, you know, um, read between the lines and determine what's good and bad information like we've been discussing. So everything that you've been saying is making me want to be a part of MNU even more so now um, than what I already had been, which is, again, you know, a testament to what you've done over there and just how passionate you are about things is inspiring. And I guess one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about was scope of practice um, because as a personal trainer in Australia, we don't have uh, very much scope. It's quite limited in terms of what yeah. we can do with nutritional prescription. A very gray, murky area. Uh, in general, and I know that you guys in the UK, and I'm kicking myself that yours isn't recognized here in Australia, um, That put that on your to-do list, please, and I'm sure I'll it, have a it lot is of people. Really, it's really high, actually, on the to-do list. I'm not sure if you saw the email I sent out, but we've recently secured yes. more um, insurance. South Africa, just, where else? Yeah, South Africa, five more countries in Europe, yep. um, and... European ones. Well, when I saw I, that there was no Australia, I deleted the email and continued. Yeah, on. yeah. Well, <laughs> Australia is like, I didn't write it in the email because I've actually heavily criticized other courses who are like, we're about to get whatever accreditation. And they basically start selling the course based on the fact that they're about or they've, they've started the process. It's like you might fail. And actually the, the company that I quite was critical about that, they failed to get the accreditation and loads of people had signed up for it. And they then were like, I only signed up for this because you said you were accredited by, you know, REPS or F FN. And um, they didn't give them their refund. So anyway, like, bonkers. So I didn't say Australia right in that Wisdom, email because I was like... confidence and integrity, man. Exactly, yeah. So <laughs> I, I'm saying this on air. Is we, are, we are in talks with um, uh, Australia, the whole of Australia, um, Mrs. Australia. And... Uh, it's like it's super high on our list because we've got so many guys mm. like PTs in Australia. We've got a G, uh, one or two GPs in Australia, which is super cool. It just it's like a testament, I think, to like mm. how forward thinking Australia can be at times. I don't know if in Australia you think that, but I look at you guys. I'm like, they're about the health. It's cool. Um, it's a big movement there. So, uh, yeah, we we're desperate to try and secure um the MNU certified nutritionist, uh, like bespoke insurance policy in Australia. And, and when it does, I'll flipping be shouting from the rooftops about it. But anyway, back to your question on, uh, yes, yeah, scope, scope of, of practice. practice. So, um, does MNU qualify coaches in, uh, you know, the, those countries to prescribe nutrition and, if so, what does that scope entail specifically? Like, are they, qualified like a dietitian to sit down and say you are to eat x portion of this food at this time um, and so on and so forth yeah that yeah that's a really good question and i'm sort of like thankful for you asking this um because it's just that whole thing of like people don't really read faqs on the bottom of websites and those sorts of things so what i should actually have is our insurance policy here because it's all got all of the cool wording on it but um we actually discourage people from so you're not qualified like a dietitian and that's what we try and say like you don't want to be qualified like a dietitian if you want to be qualified like a dietitian do dietetics and go and work in hospitals and help people with like total parental nutrition and tube feeding and like all this stuff. Whereas if you want to do nutrition, like people in the real world don't need eat this amount of food at this specific time at this time of day. Like it doesn't work for humans. And but what you can do in terms of all of the interventions that you can do under the MNU certified insurance policy is you can tell people eat these foods, here's, here's a, a, a day's plan, this, that, and the other. We tell people not to be, um, because you do just get yourself in hot water, like your insurance policy will pay out, like if you're ever stupid enough to get yourself in a bad situation, or unlucky enough, sometimes there was one um, guy, that um, one of our students of our mentorship, he got sued by a lady in America because her breasts got smaller, and he hadn't stated explicitly that that was a possible side effect of the weight loss, and um, it was like, what the hell? Um, I'm, like, fortunately, it just fell to nothing. And like, I'm sort of happy about that because it's, it's ridiculous. But anyway, people can kind of try and sue you for anything these days. But um, 
you know, if you're telling people only eat this food, like, why do you ever need to do that? There's absolutely no need to go. You must like it must be broccoli at this time of day, etc. So it's being much more inclusive of these are some um, like this is a this is what a day's food look like. But you're going to this is just vegetables. This is a whole broad range of vegetables, coaching them to be able to choose the range of things you can do, you know, specific interventions with with supplements where necessary. That's a that's another thing with regards to if if you come across as very prescriptive and you essentially take someone's um, own personal decisions out of the equation, that's where you open yourself up to issues. So but but that is where if you go take this vitamin D, um, your that's essentially prescriptive advice, and you would be covered to give that advice on the MNU certified nutritionist. Um, you're not covered to sell it, interestingly, um, and you're not. There's also a bracket of supplements you're not allowed to sell, but they're basically things that you're an idiot if you're doing. They're like appetite, you know, like suppressants, all this stuff, like like stuff that's basically medications. Just you shouldn't be going near anyway. Um, so yeah, it's nice. It basically, it bridges the gap between personal trainer and dietitian where it's like prescriptive. You can literally, you've, you know, dietetics is like, you can kind of got someone's life in your hands. It's like if they're, if they're being, you know, totally tube fed, you are literally making sure there's everything that needs to be in that thing. Um, and, uh, in that feed, so versus nutritionists is like, cool, I'm not going to completely take everything out of the equation, but I can tell you how to eat. I can tell you that, um, you know, these foods are going to make you achieve these goals and this is how much you should eat and, and go to that extent. And, um, but we go to the level of like, because some clients will say, can you tell me seven days a week, five meals a day, like whatever, three meals, two snacks, everything to eat in every single one of those things. And we would basically say to our students, never do that because that doesn't work for humans. Um, you need to give them the ability. So I don't know if you've heard me using this term, like coaching people to live, but um, it's the idea that, oh, all diets fail and, um, you know, diets are rubbish and you should only focus on things that are completely sustainable, which isn't true. Like diets don't fail. People lose weight. Most diets work. Most people actually do really freaking well on diets. They just don't have an exit plan. They don't have a end game. They don't have the ability or the habits in place. Like they have restriction habits, but they don't have maintenance habits. They've never been coached to live so certain things like eat more vegetables like yeah okay fine that's coaching to live but never understanding like what things do i have to do just to sit at maintenance like i don't know what maintenance is um people using diet breaks is like excess calories or you know a bit sort of binge mentality but actually going no the whole point of us doing a diet break psychologically before we kind of dig into another deficit or whatever it's like use that time to coach someone to live like if they can maintain for that week through various habits, through um, kind of being a bit more intuitive and understanding what happens when they eat different foods, you can leave someone in a much better state post um, fat loss phase than if you just go, okay, we're dieting down. Cool, you made it, well done. Remember the whole thing, eat more protein, eat some veg. Happy days, bye, see you later. Um, see you when you come back and you pull the weight back on. Um, yeah, anyway, I went off on one a little bit there. No, no, perfect. Um, I I agree with all of all of uh, the above. I think maintenance is definitely the hardest thing for many people, and I think there's a lot a lot more understanding about the importance of maintenance now than ever. I definitely think in the last twenty four months, people are really starting to prioritize teaching. Um, maintenance and planning it into you know a more strategic approach uh, to nutrition as opposed to uh, driving that fat loss hammer as the only tool to coaching somebody so yeah i i think all good points martin and with can i just say one more thing yeah of course sorry it was about your thing about scope of practice and because like, i went off on a bit of a tangent i forgot <laughs> what, what i was trying to say but we so we also have the i'm not sure if you've seen it but the the clinical module. So there's like PCOS, pregnancy, eating disorders, diabetes, some other ones. Um, and basically these are taught by kind of relative experts in these areas. 
And so we're kind of, again, big into the scope of practice in these areas. So, for instance, the eating disorders one is like it's it's a massive scope of practice minefield of should you take this client on? I kind of even alluded to earlier with about, you know, the financial wellness stuff. And are, are you so one of the reasons we put it in was because we wanted to maximize the chances of one of our graduates not giving someone an eating disorder. Like my, I ended my bodybuilding stuff with, with kind of disordered eating. And that came from the kind of advice I was being given, the, the, you know, the, the demonizing of certain foods, the over obsession and restrictive nature of things like bodybuilding in and of itself, even if you're a flexible dieter, there's still a level of restriction that if you're at risk is not good. But even for someone who's not at risk, being, you know, having really stupid advice and being given really set strict stuff um, can mess, mess people up. So one of the things with the eating disorder was like, make, you know, give our, our graduates, you know, the, the best chance not to be pushing people towards that. Secondly, to recognize disordered eating or, or risk factors for eating disorders to be able to refer. So I want that to be clear is like you get this insurance policy, but it's not a we're not training you to just because we teach about eating disorders. It's like you're not going to become an eating disorder counselor. And we teach them about, OK, referring like there's stuff about being appropriately inquisitive and um, sorry, appropriately curious of, you know, what can can't you say? And is it OK to go? Do you find yourself at times eating and then throwing it back up and it's like people are like oh whoa do you say that and it's like coming from one of the you know the leading experts in eating disorders who who's one of our tutors um speaking all about that so what to do what to um you know and then just the low level stuff where if someone is getting the psychological support um you know has got a medical team but you're there as a personal trainer or the nutri nutritionist supporting certain healthy habits you have an understanding same with like PCOS. We've even made people, I use this term, too evidence-based. People going, oh, does anyone know someone I can refer someone to that, you know, they've come to me and they've got type 2 diabetes or they've got PCOS and, you know, I need to refer on. And I'm like, what, why, why do you need to refer them on? Well, because they've got PCOS, like it's a clinical thing. And it's like, sorry, what, what have they come to you for? I want to get fitter. Right. You're a personal trainer. That's your job. You can help them get fitter because do you know what? It's probably the doctor who's told them go and do some exercise. And they're like, yeah, but they want to lose weight. It's like, right, cool. Is there any contraindications there? And so therefore we're teaching about pe people about PCOS. We're not telling them, yeah, put, put your clients on metformin. We're going, this is what metformin is, by the way, um, just so you're aware of it because, you know, 80% of your clients with type 2 diabetes or whatever are going to be on it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, you know, PCOS, what can you do? How can you maximally help that person lose weight? And what are some of the issues with PCOS? Because, again, you've got people out there saying all people with PCOS must be keto. Like you've got these idiots saying that, just confusing nutritionists and PTs. So we're there like, right, here's the truth about PCOS. Like I, I did my um, – my postgraduate in clinical nutrition and my research project was on PCOS. So it's like, so I deliver that one because uh, um, it's just a real area of passion for me, like um, kind of family members and, and, and these kind of personal situations, like clients I've been very close with suffering from it. So again, giving them that understanding. So with regard to scope of practice, it's like there's so many things with eating better, weight loss, just the general health, like even if someone has these clinical issues, we're going to A, give you the understanding and B, help you to understand, like even to be to be appropriately curious. So it's like with regards to diabetes, you're getting someone healthy. It's like just having an understanding that they might have to change their insulin medication. We're not telling you, don't go telling your client to change your insulin medication, but just understand that people can come off medication when they get healthier and therefore if they're starting to report certain things, get them to go to see their doctor to maybe get things adjusted. So anyway, I just wanted to say that about the, the whole scope of practice thing is like, yeah, even telling people how to refer, when to refer, what to be to understand is for me just a huge part of being able to be an ethical practitioner, you know, acting with integrity. So anyway, that was my bit of a better answer. No, awesome. Thank you for uh, adding that on to the end. I 
I'm grateful that you got that one in there. So I guess moving forward, you know, as practitioners, when we, you know, have scope to prescribe, we're, we're going to be dealing with people who bring to us um, many pre-ingrained beliefs um, and misconceptions about nutrition. And I love one of the quotes from your site, you know, that the value of Mac Nutrition has become to challenge misinformation and re-educate those who are willing to listen. Um, Mac Nutrition will always be known as a company who will challenge unscientific mainstream ideas, dogmas and corporate messages that can stop people achieving their goals or at worst of all, rob them of their health. I thought that was brilliant and yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to talk about that more and to not uh, make this overly exhaustive because I think we, you and I could probably talk for hours and hours on end and I know you go to bed yeah. at 4 a.m. which is in like five hours so we could be in strife. But if you can give us a quick rundown on some of the misconceptions you've seen uh, in the industry and I'll kick off with uh, the first one which is breakfast. Uh, people have the idea that they have to eat breakfast to kickstart their metabolism um, and that it's a part of the you know Western diet, or you know it's common uh, practice for people to have breakfast. So, do you think breakfast is a good idea for everybody in all situations? And what's the lowdown? Yeah, so breakfast is a bit of my um, is like one of my hobby horses, like a, a bugbear. It's something I love to talk about, and I wrote um, my opinion editorial for Examine um, on this, and it it kicked off a bit. It's like a, a bit of a social media. Um, backlash with certain dietitians freaking out and then certain researchers coming to my sort of aid and then these dietitians going to these researchers you're not qualified to comment on this like it was professor kevin tipton was like this was a really good article and then these dietitians were like no it's not you're not qualified to talk in this it's like flipping heck he's a professor like research nutrition it's like if he's not qualified who is but um yeah breakfast is just this you, I mean, you set up the question so easily, but people still don't get it. It's like, is it the most important meal of the day? Must everyone have it at all times? And there are genuinely people out there who are like, yeah, that, yeah, everyone, every day you must know, you know, it's unbelievable people are that close minded. So, and straight away, as soon as I go, you can skip breakfast. There's no reason to not eat it, et cetera. It's like, oh, so we sh none of us should eat breakfast. It's like, whoa, where did that come from? Um, <clears throat> So, yeah, it's just it's one of those things where I think there's a thing about propaganda, where it's if you if a lie is told enough or with vehemently enough, it can just become a truth. And, you know, it's never been truer than with the, the you must eat breakfast mantra. And, you know, it doesn't kickstart your metabolism. It doesn't um, you know, make you burn more calories. You don't go into starvation mode if you don't eat breakfast. Um, you don't like the evidence pretty much unequivocally shows that you do not overeat when you skip breakfast like it and it's like that's almost a surprising finding for me because it's such a common sense like common sense is the worst thing that you should ever use when talking about human beings and nutritional science but like oh it's common sense if you skip it then you'll you'll binge and it's like no it actually doesn't happen um people tend to eat fewer calories when they skip breakfast so then it's like well why do we observe this thing with people who skip breakfast seemingly being more or higher bmi than people who don't and it's like yeah really good question why is that the case um someone go and find out my personal opinion which is supported by the um data that you doesn't get reported but it's within all of the research is when we take that group who's more overweight and they do skip breakfast, they also exercise less, eat less vegetables, smoke more, drink more. The same as meat eaters. Why are people who eat more meat generally more unhealthy? Because mechanistically, there's no reason that eating meat should make you more unhealthy. Um, but, but the answer is they do less exercise, eat less vegetables, smoke more. And generally, these people are have less, they are less health seeking, they have less of the health seeking behaviors that we see in the alternative groups. So <clears throat> it's very difficult to quantify what's going on. And obviously, the people who are skipping breakfast must 
be overeating because they are more overweight and we know that calories matter. But where is that happening? How is it happening? And actually, we have the research that shows us, right, skip breakfast, intermittent fasting, whatever you want to call it. Oh, look, people can lose weight. So, yeah, it's a big a big myth and you can choose it, take it or leave it. And the thing that I tell people is be a conscientious breakfast eater or breakfast skipper. It's those who are unconscientious in their habits that end up with issues. If you're conscientious in your breakfast skipping, plan for your first meal because it's easy to plan when you're at home. But once you're out and about, if you skip breakfast and then you become hungry, what are you going to choose? Plan ahead. There you go. Stop talking. Perfect. You don't have to stop talking. You just keep going. Um, yeah. Gluten. This one is very pervasive. I don't know if it's still uh, doing the rounds in the UK, but over here there's a lot of personal trainers and I actually went into war with one uh, online, which I, I actually never do. But this guy was basically, he was having a go at my practice because I allow my clients um, to eat foods that they choose. Um, and he said things along the lines of, if your coach is telling you that you can eat gluten, they don't give a, he, he was swearing and all these kind of things, which made, made his case even worse. Um, you know, they don't give an F about your health. You know, they obviously don't know what they're doing, this and that. Like it was pretty, it wasn't like, here's an informative video on, you know, some mechanistic, uh, on you know, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, if your coach is telling you you can eat carbs, they're an idiot and rah, 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 and here's why. And it was directed to me. So I was like, okay, I'm going to respond here and I'm going <laughs> to break this one down. Um, so do you want to explain to listeners, you know, I guess why gluten isn't an issue for 99% of the population um, and, you know, what to do about it, how to find out if they do need to, you know, avoid gluten. Mm. Yeah, it's a really interesting one. I was I, I can't remember when I was talking about this super recently. It might have been literally a couple of hours ago on an Instagram live I was doing. Someone might have asked me a question, but yeah, it was. It actually was. How funny. So the whole thing, like gluten is obviously an issue for a very distinct population, which is celiac. So they are they have an autoimmune condition. So Everyone agrees on that. Happy days. Now, there's this this step down from that where we have non-celiac gluten sensitivity, right? And I I was a big believer, if that if that's a thing. You know, the, the research was kind of there to show that it was something, and it's still there to show that it's something. But we now have all of this data coming out actually showing that people who self-diagnose with non-celiac, they're not they're not celiac. They've been tested. Um, but they seem to get issues eating gluten containing products. So they self diagnose and then they're actually tested. So that, so where the whole evidence based practice is really helpful is because observation is fraught with errors. And this is when I see people like, Oh, you can talk all your science, but I know what works with my clients. And it's like, no, because science can actually improve what you do. And when science shows what you're doing is either absolutely wrong or completely inefficient, like let's take fasted cardio. Um, yeah, I do fasted cardio with my clients and they lose weight. It's like, cool. What were they doing before? Well, nothing. Right. So they're doing cardio. Um, understanding that, oh, look, you've got more tools in your box. They can just do cardio whenever. And actually the fact that you burn a little bit more fat in the, you know, oxidation, fat oxidation does not equal fat loss. Um, science can tell us that. And that's why it's really freaking helpful. So again, um, I debated Professor Tim Nopes. I don't know if you managed to listen to that, but unbelievable the fact that he is an A1 rated scientist. We were discussing diabetes, carbohydrate, insulin resistance. And I'm sitting there thinking this guy is super famous. He's a medically qualified doctor. He's, you know, it, this is his area. He has one area that he's this championing. This is all he, he does now. And I'm like a kind of a bit of a generalist, if I'm honest. And um, he's there and he basically goes, if the science can't prove it, then um, the science needs to catch up because I've observed it and I'm right. It's basically, or he did, those were his words apart from that I'm right. Everything else was almost verbatim. And um, like blood leaching, if people don't know what that is, like this is like basically putting like leeches on your body to get rid of like the baddies. 
it uh, like this is like an old school practice that doctors did but through their observations um they had this like all this crazy stuff i think they called it like humors or something weird like that and it was basically like the fire the wind something all right it was like weird stuff that all came from like good doctors like there was this other thing called like the the black death of childbirth or something and it was like doctors who ignored science and they're like no we're gonna we're gonna understand this and someone just took a step back and it was this whole thing of like people they, they were delivering babies and then these the babies were dying or no the mothers were dying i think and then they're like i'm going to study this we're going to we're going to look at the cadavers at night and we're going to look and see what it is what's happening and was okay next morning okay delivering babies oh they're, they're all dying they're all dying and then someone with an actual scientific mindset stood back and went, are you washing your hands between cutting up dead bodies and delivering babies? And they, this person was ignored until the scientific method showed us. It was like, oh, my goodness, that's the issue. But anyway, um, going off on one. So <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the gluten thing, so non-celiac gluten sensitivity, we can now test this properly and go placebos. We can blind people um not tell them what's happening and then you can challenge them with it and see if their symptoms come back and we've we've actually seen that these people with non-celiac gluten sensitivity might be just reacting to like fermentable carbohydrates getting bloating which isn't a gluten issue um and so actually the percentage of people who are genuinely reacting to gluten as a substance is this tiny 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 amount of people likewise they might be a bit sensitive to it, but it's not stopping them losing weight because that's energy balance. And the people going, cut out gluten, the gluten's the reason you're not losing fat. And it's like, guess what? If you're celiac, if you're genu if gluten is genuinely harming your microvilli, your your gastrointestinal tract, guess what happens to those people? They lose shed loads of weight because their gut is unhealthy. You you remove it and they gain weight. So it's not stopping you losing weight. Um, it's And then the rest of us, for like 99% of the population, uh, I don't know if that's right, actually. Let's go, it's like 95 plus percent because um, I don't know the exact stats. Um, it's absolutely fine. It, we can deal with it. Any challenges, like there's, we, we can talk about the hormetic response. Like when you eat fruits and vegetables like we get a hormetic response and we build our system because of this like it's almost like low dose poison and your body gets stronger like that's what we're talking about here um just gluten is not an issue and like people just it's such a cool buzzword it's good to sell your services it's you know people read wheat belly and oh gmos are killing us like that's where science is so useful because it's actually tested this stuff like Low carb has been tested for 10 million years, like, well, not 10 million years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. We know um, these things aren't causing issues. So they, yeah, there you go. I, yeah. No, that guy's an idiot, whoever he is, <laughs> idiot. <laughs> uh, brilliant response, Martin. And I guess one final question I wanted to ask you, uh, because we've, we've gone on uh, quite a while here, which I wish... I wish we had more time and I didn't have clients warming up in the background uh, yeah. out here. <laughs> we'll do another show another time. Yeah, we'll definitely have to get you back on, man. Um, is self-sabotage. I guess this is one big area a lot of people struggle with. You know, they'll set a target weight, they'll get there or they'll be getting closer and then they start justifying whatever it is that they're doing and some, you know, demonstrating some uh, cognitive dissonance and all those types of things. So what are your thoughts? How do you deal with it? And what's your advice for coaches or individuals experiencing that? Mm. Yeah, self-sabotage is such a, um, like, it's one of those instances where sometimes I would actually recommend people going and kind of speaking to someone like, considering something like cbt cognitive behavioral therapy and, and these kind of things some some kind of mental training techniques because for some of us it's not it's not clinical it's just uh well i'm saying this like i'm an expert but i believe it's not clinical it's a a bit of a human trait people get like you said they're fairly comfortable with where they're at it's they start to settle of like geez i set myself this this goal target i'm 80 percent of the way there and sometimes I would actually say this, just a little a bit of a preface, is sometimes they'll realize I've put in a decent amount of effort 
and I've got this far and I'm, this has been really cool, you know, working with this practitioner. I never thought I'd get this far with such little ease. Then there becomes this trade-off of results versus effort. And actually they start to realize I have to put in significantly more effort to get this last 20% of the way, for instance. And um, so there is, there's also a discussion between the coach and the client there of have the goalposts moved? Have you, you know, have we reached some kind of goal where it's like, geez, I would be happy to stick here for a, a period of time. And maybe there's a, um, uh, a dichotomy of goals where the coach thinks we're still aiming for that when the clients actually change. It. It's like, you know, what? I'm really happy with, with where I'm at and those kind of things. Whereas there's also the instance where they're like, they desperately want to get to that goal, but they just keep sabotaging and whether or not it's clinical or not. One thing that I, um, have spoken a bit about is like goal setting is such a boring thing. Like it's almost like the first thing you learn, like at PT school and whatever goal setting and smarter goals and this kind of thing. But actually if you go like advanced goal setting and going, you know what we're going to, like people get to the end of a diet or the end of a, a period or end of a phase and it's like a diet break or, or whatever, they don't actually have a new goal. So setting smaller, shorter goals with a reason, with some level of excitement or why are you doing that? So like multi-phase dieting, so different speeds of dieting, because fast weight loss is so motivating. And we now know it's not going to give you metabolic damage. So that's like, oh, that's freaking cool. It, um, you know, that that level of effort, like a diet is, off, I say this quite often, a diet is a diet. There's a level of restriction, whether you're in a 500 calorie deficit or a 1500 calorie deficit. And therefore, oh man, like 1500 calorie deficit, I'm hungry and I'm restricting and this, that and the other. But I love seeing those scales go down. I love, you know, I love that rate of progress. But sometimes that's unsustainable. So then we go back to, okay, well, what's the next phase we're looking at? Um, is there a goal? Where do we want to hit? Rather than just, I'm going to lose four stone in whatever number of months and we're just going to, and because then that's, that sort of self sabotage is like, ah, oh, you know, I've lost two stone and, but I just want to go out and do this and do that. And those, those habits that creep in. So again, coaching people to live, I think during the long process can help with the end because self sabotage tends to come in towards the end. Um, not always, but sometimes. So that coaching to live, that understanding of, um, cause there also is just the worry of binging disorders. Like I can do restriction really freaking well, but I can't do ad libitum. And you, if you see that in your clients, if your clients report, um, yeah, I can, I can, I can, I can restrict. I'm really freaking good at restricting, but, but I can't do one cookie. I can't do any kind of once you let the reins off a bit, I just, you know, give them an inch, they take a mile, that kind of scenario. Um, yeah, so a bit of a, a wishy-washy answer there, but I think there's it's just a few take-home things there. Yeah, no, I think the self-sabotage does definitely come to the end. And I'm very much in agreement with you. Um, it was one of the other questions I wanted to ask if time was permitted was, you know, when when... Uh, fat loss can be fast versus when it can be slow and you sort of touched on that there and I definitely agree there needs to be excitement um, and motivation and a different type of challenge um, for our clients because yeah that slow monotonous weight loss um, can lead to self-sabotage and just like you know extremely fast weight loss you know over longer periods and you know chronic uh, durations can also lead to that self-sabotage because there is no um, change of pace and I think that's important because we can we can almost uh, alter periods of living life versus you know prioritizing our goal and our health um, and then over time they can sort of start to marry up a little bit more closely and I think you hit the nail on the head there so Martin thank you very much for coming on the show it was a pleasure meeting you man I really pleasure. do want to get you back on because I had a bucket load of questions that we didn't get to um, and I want to be picking your brain about those and, yeah, potentially discuss getting you to Australia in the near future. Yeah, cool. Thanks very much for having me. Not a problem, man. 